Okay, on behalf of Emerge Africa, it's an absolute delight and privilege to welcome you to this webinar where we have Dr. Anita Campbell and Sukena Welji sharing experiences and perspectives from the 2024 Eden DLE conference, which is subtitled AI Futures in Teaching and Learning. Um, the bio information we have for Anita and for Sukena um, is quite detailed and indicates why they are here in terms of a whole range of experiences and research and capacities. But basically, um, Dr. Nita Campbell is an enthusiastic engineering mathematics senior lecturer in the academic support program for education at University of Cape Town. Um, and her PhD is on promoting growth mindsets in engineering mathematics students. So a lot of her research is about promoting growth mindsets. But there's another side to her work, which us at UCT have seen since 2011, I'm sure, um, in KZN people saw that much earlier as well. Her focus on making innovative and quite systematic use of various technologies to support teaching and learning both technologically and pedagogically. Um, and certainly she is, has been really innovative over the years in many different ways. And then with Sukena, who's director of SILT, the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching at UCT. And what I find interesting about Sukena's bio and the work that she does is the way she operates at this interface between policy and strategy at the um, big macro view level, and also in terms of how do you actually translate policy into strategy, and how do you reconfigure policy in relation to changing circumstances and shocks like the pandemic was a massive shock that required policy and strategy readjustment. Like I think the wave of um, use of generative AI has some of the elements of a shock to a lot of systems as well. So without any further delay, I'm handing over to the two of you, Anita and Sukena. Great. Well, thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction. Um, Silterbo has been, uh, to me, the, the bright and bubbling place at UCT where innovations happen. Um, yeah, and I'm delighted to share a bit of time with um, people who are attending live or might catch the recording. Um, so the, the people who are attending, maybe you could pop into the chat something about your conference experience. Um, have you ever attended a conference? Um, and if so, on what topic? Or if you are quite a frequenter of conferences, have you ever attended an EDEN conference? EDEN stands for the European Digital Education Network. Mm, Sukena, am I right? Um, but it is a, a European-based institution. They have an annual conference and um, they have a lot of online activities, which is how I heard about them. Um, so if um, you've ever had the, the privilege of, of attending a conference there, um, I, I'd be interested. I'm, I'm sure Zucana has. Um, yeah, and thanks for that link. I can tell you how I landed up there is because I was going to Austria where the conference was this year um, for a different conference. And I thought, well, since I'm going all that way, what else is around <laughs> in Austria? I found this conference and I'm like, oh, AI, got to go do me a bit of that. Um, so um, I didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, I organized two conferences last year. One was over a thousand people. One was under a hundred people. Um, I like 
networking um, and I went with an open mind. And I can tell you that as someone who um, was, I, I, I went with no pressure, basically. I was presenting, but um, being a conference of, I think there were about 300 people at, at this Eden conference, which makes it a sort of medium, in my view, size conference. It means that there are multiple parallel sessions. The chances that someone is going to be attending or the chances that you're going to have a high attendance is very small um, because of the multiple competing interests and being a nobody at a conference. If, if you're someone who uh, you've got collaborators, you've got research students at a conference, um, or if you are attending your own students' presentations, you actually need to spend time with them. So um, it does make it a bit hard to uh, to get to get an audience. So I was expecting basically me and the other presenters in the session, maybe with one or two other people. I would say I got maybe double that, making it slightly more than 10 people attending my talk. <laughs> um, and I think that was because there were multiple people presenting in one of the um, talks in my session. But it was it was really um, useful just to be able to think again about the work that I was talking on. Um, right, I'm just looking at the, uh, the chat. Um, ah, social science. So my work is from social psychology. Um, my PhD, I completed in 2020 on growth mindsets. So I teach maths to engineering students who have failed. So I'm interested in doing extra things with the additional time that I have with my students to try and inspire them because they've just been wounded, haven't been top achievers at school and failing when they get to university in the subject they were best at typically at school. So they need cheering up. And I've um, dabbled with using some AI tools, doing little projects, uh, to try and get a bit of creativity in. Um, ChatGPT is pretty poor at maths, so that makes quite fertile learning material for us to check, you know. Um, and um, and most of my conference attendance is in either the maths education space or engineering education space. So digital education is, it's not core. Um, it's digital and online learning. And since our experience in um, COVID times, a lot of overlap, I felt. Um, all right. So um, I am still getting a twirling circle of death on my computer saying I can't get into Zoom to share my presentation, but I have emailed it to myself and will attempt to open it from there. Yeah. Um, maybe I should pause maybe now. While, yes, yeah, maybe while Stina, you're maybe... doing doing that, you can you can email it to me and I can share maybe uh, if that helps. Okay, thank you. Let's but try that as while well. you're doing that, maybe I can also just say um, how I got to Eden. So yes. um, I it was my second Eden conference. Uh, so uh, for people who don't know, it was in Graz in Vienna. And the previous year was my first, the first time I went to an Eden conference, which was in Dublin, in Ireland. And um, so it was very interesting. Um, and, and I mean, this is not, that's not, I'm not saying anything new, but the the city in which, you know, the conference is really does shape and influence the experience, I think. And both of them were, were really good experiences. But um the the one in in Ireland in the, the year before was, was a lot bigger, um, and I think that's because the Irish university system is very engaged in digital learning and digital education, and so there were a lot of local universities. Even though it was hosted by one university, um, it it was it was uh, it it just felt like quite a large conference. Even though I think it was probably like three fifty four hundred people um, and at that conference I presented on um, digital transformation in, in universities using the work that I've been doing at UCC around the digital and online education policy development and, and strategy 
And then, so I, I, I thought it was very valuable in just answering um, Karina's question. I mean, I think it's really a good one because there's this kind of in, like when you sometimes go to a conference, there's a kind of in group of people who seem to sort of know each other and, and you kind of sometimes feel a little bit on the fringe maybe, and maybe that's okay because you go it's the first time. But I think I, I enjoy, personally enjoyed going to the first Eden party because it was in Ireland and I know just I have collaborators um, in Ireland and the UK who I've met online or have done things with. So it was really nice meeting people um, who I had met online during COVID. So it was, and, I, and I'm sorry I'm talking about the one previously, but it gives context to what I would say my experience with this one was, was it was the first Eden, I think, after COVID that they had in person. So it was like a huge gathering and like wedding almost, like everyone got together as if they had not seen their long lost family for years, which in fact was true. So there was a kind of celebratory mood around it because everyone was so like delighted to be back to face to face conference. And I think Tony, I'd just be interested in your like what you think has happened to conferencing post COVID. Um uh, and I know it's 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 a sort of interesting space. So then I, I I got a lot out of it that year. And yes, it did feel like it is European um based organization. So if it was predominantly, I did think, oh, I'm from South Africa, will there be relevance? Um, but you know, as always, um there were quite a few South African delegates um at um the the, the Eden in Ireland and we met up, but also I felt that the conversations that were happening in maybe it was like post-COVID conversations were very relevant to our context. So that's why when I had the opportunity, I I went to the one that, that Anita and I attended together. Um, and the theme was AI and education and futures and so on. And so um, it just fitted in with the work that I am doing or was, uh, was doing. I was able to share some, some of the thinking, particularly around assessments and AI. So again, it was, Quite a different it was a bit smaller um but i did feel and, and it was interesting going the second time you kind of feel less of an outsider because you've gone a second time and you know people so that that's really how i ended up there but it's very much in my kind of area of, of, of thinking about digital education and and the capacity but also shape like how you can shape it for your context which is really what what i'm interested in doing so i'll stop there and Anita, I don't know if you you can share your slides or whether you'd like me me to do that. Right. Um. I I've got my presentation here, and we can attempt to share sh slides. Okay. I really don't know what's happening with the Zoom on my computer, um, but I just persevere. So at the conference, I, I um had no flash drive, nothing. I had my my phone and my presentation uh, with a, a little phone cable that I uh, could connect to the computer in the venue and it worked very well. Uh, share. Microsoft OneDrive and let's see what happens. So my mood of the conference was, um, it was a very warm environment. It was a warm community and uh, the day before the conference started, I went to collect my registration things. Uh, there was the, the welcome in reception on, I think it was a Sunday evening and the conference started on Monday. And um, there were, uh, am I still connected? I'm being asked to sign in. Sorry, uh, let me just see. Oh yeah, I am still there with you. Double dating, how weird. Okay. Who wants me to sign in again? I will comply. Sorry. Um, the first thing I noticed was South African names. <laughs> um, Prince Lou. I'm like, what? Karen Gras, Austria. Uh, and and then Sian Sukena from UCT. So we didn't even know um, we were both going to be there. And um, yeah, I okay, allow one another devices, da, 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 tap on allow, except there is no allow, 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 
Hey. This is not going according to plan. Okay, so Kena, I have emailed you the presentation. Let's try plan B. Um, if you would be able to open it up for me, please. Everything is given okay, me I'm just ideas. I'm just opening it up. So let me thank you. So um uh it was well organized the university of graz is quite large but it's an open campus that's quite easy to navigate they have good maps um lovely welcoming uh address okay great there it is um so just and, let me know uh, when you want to move to the next slide sure so if you go into the website this is the photo you see and look it's me and if you want to see what I was doing most of the time, the next slide is a zoom in. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> a very bad photo. Quickly moving on. Um, I'll meet you in while I chat. Okay, so here is a summary of the, the four themes um, that uh, they, they've defined their own themes, um, but these ones um, seem to, I, I, I went to chat GBT or I think it was co-pilot, um, looked at the proceedings and from the papers that were published in the proceedings asked what were the themes. So these are the themes that turned up. So if you're watching this and you have an interest in um, AI and digital education, then you might consider which ones of these are your interests and maybe just pop into the, the chat, um, the numbers that, that align with your interests. Maybe it's all of them one, two, three, or four, or maybe just some. And for those who maybe are traveling, can I even read this out? I don't think I've even tested that. My reading ability. I think your device probably shows it better <laughs> than I can see it now. Um, I can tell you that my overall impression about the conference was, um, and maybe it's because of the path I chose through the topics that um, I attended and the workshops I went to, I did not come out with a sense of feeling, now I understand the state of the art of AI and technology. My main takeaway was that people are still grappling with what it means to be including AI in your teaching and learning practices that uh, we are um, on a roller coaster ride and no one is the expert yet. <laughs> but at least we're asking questions and we are um, aware of the limitations. So for example, um, don't think that you can try and um, audit what people are doing and say, oh, you used AI and you weren't allowed to for this essay um, and we found you out. That 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 game is not worth playing anymore. Um, I think our, our department um, of, of SALT at, at UCT uh, unit of SALT, they, they're, uh, I've just been at a meeting where the message is AI detectors do not work. So um, you gotta move on. Although I must say some of the people who were presenting or who were talking, um, who haven't had much experience perhaps yet in the use of AI for assessments, um, it was not universally understood that you, you can not really control whether AI is being used or not. Um, so I thought I was going into this very um, expert space but in fact, I found that there were people like myself who were seeking, um, you know, who were quite newcomers. Um, and another uh, uh, lecturer who teaches chemistry from Portugal was like me, a practitioner teaching, wanting to find ideas and just attracted to how um, AI needs to be used because her, she says, and quote, um, my students um, need this. They, they need to be able to use AI. I need to be able to support them using this. And um, that's, that's what attracted her to the conference. 
I mean, it helps that it was in Austria, but still. <laughs> it was also outside of, of the um, area of interest. And um, yeah, she was not there as a tourist. She was a seeker. Right. Thank you. So you can move on. So um, from the chat, you might be able to spark people with some of their interests. I'm not going to go through the whole proceedings and everything. I'm going to give you some of the highlights that I found. Um, and one was this. Estonia is cool. Um, who knew? Did you know? I didn't know. Estonia for 20 years have been a digital nation. Um, they are like the grandparents of digital education because um, as the this keynote speaker said, um, they don't be, they're not asking the kinds of questions like, should we digitize our schools or not? They're talking about, should we have um, a Google product or should we have a home created product for our digital learning in our schools? Because the entire country in all their schools runs digitally. They have internet in every school. They have computers in every school. Their country, she said, until a week before the conference, there was nothing that you could not do online apart from get divorced. And that was sorted out a week before she arrived. Not, not that she got divorced, but uh, you know, that, that there is now, um, in order to have a society where uh, digitization is at such a high level, she explained that they had this um, massive um, boost and a drive to change society. And I'm like, I can't see that happening in, in South Africa. I can't even see that happening at UCT, uh, where autonomy is quite a thing. It will take quite a while to convince everyone that you all should be doing the same sort of thing. Um, and, and to get that switch happening quite fast, what helped Estonia was um, they had not been allowed to be entrepreneurial um, under the Soviet rule. And so when they were given that freedom, um, they really grabbed it. And there was a political decision made to digitize, to prioritize using the small amount of money that they had to prioritize digitizing the nation. So it became a campaign. Um, there would be... Um, libraries got computers and they held evening classes for society just to get become computer literate. Um, if you follow this QR code, you can um, read a bit more about um, the changes over basically 20 years of, of enculturing, well, yeah, it's about 20 years more than, enculturing the community to appreciating the value of digitalization and then getting it into the schools. Also, they share a common language. So there was um, a drive to create um, Estonia-specific resources, which then again kept the community going. Um, so um, Estonia is a good example of, I, I think, the ultimate. But we don't have a small country. Um, we have large challenges. And we're not, we're not as perhaps um, all together, you know, all thinking as similarly, perhaps. We don't share a common language in South Africa, a common home language like they do in Estonia. They, I mean, there's immigrants as well, but if you go to an Estonian school, you have to speak Estonian. So um, that was very eye-opening to me. Um, right, just as an aside. She said she had to check her um, her her air ticket. Um, she missed the conference dinner and came in after a 33-hour journey from Estonia to Austria. She had to check that they hadn't misdirected her to Australia for this very long trip. It might have taken her less time to come via Australia, she said, <laughs> because of travel delays um, and and sad to say, in uh, a lot of the experiences I've had recently, people are saying the German travel system seems to cause a lot of delays. So um, if you are traveling to Europe and you've got the option to either travel through Germany or not, maybe try and direct your flights so you don't go through Germany. 
Okay. Um, should we move on to the next person I'd like to speak about? Um, so, um, Ron Ost oh, am I saying it right? Oh, Oston um, is based in Canada at the um, Vibe University. Um, I don't see it here. He's semi-retired, but I think he's still connected to. Hmm, can't remember what the name is of the university there. It starts with an A. Um, they do lots of exciting um, digital digital kind of innovations. Probably someone here knows. Anyway, if you Google him, you'll probably see. A, a, it sounds like an abacus. Um, and uh, he was explaining this tool. There's uh, two versions of it. If you take the QR code, I think you'll go to the page where um, you can try out their um, AI Tutor Pro. Sounds really great. It's basically a, a sort of tailored version of a chatbot uh, or uh, an LLM designed to support your learning. So it's basically being programmed with very big prompts that are trying to direct answers to be useful for an educational situation. So I played around with this, um, thinking, well, I know ChatGPT's maths is not so great yet. How will it do? It was not great, but it was sort of okay. So as a teacher, if you know the content better than the tool, uh, which is pretty much at the moment, the way we have to use the tools. It's not very good for learning something you can't um, you can't verify yourself because you, you can't tell what's true or not from an, an LLM. But uh, with this um, with their package, it's it's trying to take you a bit deeper in the learning. So if I say, right, I'm trying to learn this, it says, well, what's your background? What do you know? It will prompt you for questions um, and I I found it fairly useful to a point but um, a little bit limited for something like maths it might be better for something that is more um, discussion and debate oriented to try and um, ask leading questions why should that be the case or so um, that was quite a useful tool um, and again that that showed me the limitations of the AI tools that we think uh, perhaps the promise is going to be bigger than what can be delivered. So while it gave me some suggestions for my teaching, this was not like, oh, yay, we are at the point where everyone has a personalized tutor in their pocket. Um, it's quite hit and miss as to the time you're going to spend engage in and having to type or talk in talking is very nice but it's hard to talk in maths um the, the tool is really not smooth and slick enough yet uh to replace an interaction with someone who can you can do a mixture of voice writing symbols in maths um and and question and answer right so uh let's move on to the next one and then this is a person who is the next head of um, Eden taking, um, it's October, coming up. In October, um, Vim, forget his surname, should be there. Oh, yes, there it is, uh, is, is going to be leading um, Eden um, for the next, I, I don't know what the term is, year or two. He's a Belgian, but he has connections to South Africa because just down the road in Stellenbosch, is someone whose PhD he is supervising. Um, so I think you you know probably um, from this network who I'm talking about, whose name forgets, JP. I uh, forget JP's surname, but um, JP is um, supervised um, by Vim, who has been on multiple visits to South Africa. Right. Um, and I think that's pretty much the, uh, okay, so um, there's a link to the proceedings where you'll find the published papers, um, not the all the talks. So my presentation was just a um, presentation.
presentation only. I didn't write a conference paper. The majority of the talks were like that. There were also a fair number of workshops and the workshops uh, also are not um, published uh, in, in the proceedings that I could notice. Um, but that was the, the main theme, learning in the age of AI. And I guess it satisfied me because it's it did tease out my imagination. Um, and I think one more slide, Sukhena, please. Um, yeah, so this was at the end of the conference. Uh, they did a, a survey um, of takeaways. And it was so heartwarming to see that uh, the deeper we're going into the use of technology, the more humanity is showing up as um, as the takeaway. You know, um, maybe it's it's the attraction of people coming to a conference that is about teaching and learning with AI that they already come from a a giving perspective. Um, but I was really encouraged to see um, that caring is the biggest word in this word cloud. Um, and there's humanity, there's the idea of ethics, transparency, um, experimenting. Um, yeah, so um, that was to me a fairly good summary of the mood that I got from the conference. And I think there is one more slide. Ah, uh, yes. So this is what people wrote in, um, saying, what do you see the role of AI in the next five to 10 years for university teachers and students? So um, teachers can be using AI for writing course proposals, writing content, organizing lectures, and assessments. Being teacher assistants, okay? So in my maths tutorial, I imagine training up an AI tool with my course material or with other verifiable correct maths work. And, and then saying, this is the way I would like you to help my students think about problems. So having a... Um, a tailored AI tool that is your teaching assistant. I like that one. And then for doing administrative tasks, in fact, the words that they used was sort of as administrative, uh, almost like administrators, uh, sort of implying taking away jobs that currently humans do as administrators. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then for university students, um, feedback foster and perhaps more precisely uh, for maths, I'm still wondering it, the maths has to improve quite a bit. But in five to 10 years, for sure, I'm expecting that um, I can use my Google glasses, look at the work, and then feedback would be generated in I don't know, probably a hologram that I could see in front of me. Maybe the mistakes would be highlighted in color as I'm looking over a transcript. Um, really efficient feedback is, is going to become possible. But, and, and also for the purpose of developing yourself. Um, so growth mindset is my interest. And the, the way that feedback is handled is um, really, in my view, crucial to how you encourage people to be trying to develop themselves further or to view it as a judgment, are you good or bad, and um, hide if you're not good. Um, all right, and then those other things, translations, understanding text, summarizing text, um, helping to write and edit papers um, as students and to do research. So this is an area where I still am looking for clarity. What, what are the boundaries? And I think we're still grappling with that as a university. So there is a point for discussion. 
The rest of my slides are really just looking at my own presentation um, to fill the time if we needed to, but I think let's, let's cut it there, Sukena, and oh, we can just have the title, there it is. So that's what I spoke about. Um, but I'm not going to take you through the presentation. So uh, over to you, Sukena. Thank you for sharing Thanks. slides. No, no problem. Anita, I'm happy for you to maybe go do a quick run through if you want, because I was also planning to do a quick, uh, you know, um, run through what I spoke about. So you're welcome to if you want to. I mean, you don't have to, but we have got time. Okay. Um, I have a tendency to speak too much, so <laughs> let's let's stop it now, and then um, okay, you, you can go through. Um, I think okay, your work okay. is a bit more core to the interests of the people okay. who are here. Sure, um, sure. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks, Lisa. That was really interesting. It was actually nice to have um, some of those, like, you know, reminder of those. I mean, I, I, you know, one thing I'm just sitting here and I'm reflecting and saying that I, because it's um, a conference with many streams and I didn't... <clears throat> managed to get to Anissa's presentation and I don't think she managed to get to mine and in many ways you get to a conference and she and I could have had 30 different conference experiences depending on what um, sessions we chose um, and and I think that's also something that you know you get so much FOMO because you're looking across things off. it's I wanted to go to that one that one and that one and then so I think it's just one of the challenges of um in-person conferences um again tony would be interested to sort of hear your take on that um so i yeah i i haven't got like i was looking particularly for um presentations that were around uh, what are people doing around assessment um because that's something that i'm you know working with right now in the UPT context and that was what my presentation was also with the kind of conceptual um, think thought process through what we could do uh, around this and I'll share some of those slides in a minute but I was just thinking that I agree with you Anita um, although I mean having been to um, Eden before and other digital um, education conferences and, and, and online webinars I wasn't expecting something to be kind of um, you know, like I'd go there and all my problems would be solved or I would walk away knowing, you know, like having having seen the light or being exposed to new knowledge. Um, and that's not to criticise it in any way. I, I see the conference space or <clears throat> such as Eden much more about the relational networking and people and the opportunity to connect with people um, over you know in five minute conversations or go to the presentation and have a have a kind of interaction afterwards or or make that say oh I'd like to follow up with that person um and I think that's that's the kind of more realistic approach because it, there's just so much information overload and certainly I think at Eden um there's a mixture of um kind of sort of practitioner some kind of subtle type scholarly um so so some you know the you can write a full paper that get, that if accepted gets published in the conference proceedings and um there's a best paper award and then there's what they call concise papers <clears throat> which is really an extended abstract which is what i submit i wasn't present uh presenting the full paper but you know you still have to justify what you're going to talk about and so on. And then I think there's workshops and so on. So I think that's quite a nice mix. Um, but I, I have to say, and maybe before I get to my, my presentation, uh, um, is that um, when I looked at the program, I was like, oh no, I'm on the last session of the last day, <laughs> you know, after the debate and everyone will be catching flights. And, and that was actually true. On the other hand, I still managed to get like, I don't know, but 20 or 20, 25 people, I think, which is not bad from uh, coming to it. But I just like, oh, of all the luck, that was like the last session of the last day. And then you're kind of like waiting for two days to do your presentation. You kind of feel by that time, everything has happened. But, you know, that's the luck of the draw, I think. 
suppose, and, and you just have to kind of uh, go with it. But in the end, it was fine. Um, so apart from the, um, the, you know, you mentioned some of the keynote, and you also mentioned some of the interesting um, presentations. What Eden does is they also have what's called the Oxford Debate every year, where everybody gets together and there's, there's an opposition and a proposition. And this year, um, the debate um, topic was um, AI, something like, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but remembering, it's something like AI policies are toothless, useless, and a waste of time. And I think that was like a really interesting um, provocation, actually, for me, because um, I lead a UC's AI and education working group, which is trying to coordinate, you know, uh, some, you know, the university's response to generative AI, both from guidance, guardrails. We're not going towards the policy, but before this session, I just came from a workshop that I was running where we've actually got a draft framework now in place that we're workshopping with <clears throat> the group. And so that proposition is actually quite interesting. And I think, I don't know if you were there for the debate, Anita, um, but it was quite heated, you know. And um, you know, there were props and 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 I think there was quite a nice vibe and it was actually paired by um our colleague uh, at UNISA, Paul Prinsloo, Professor Paul Prinsloo, who is an Eden thought, by the way. So I mean even though it's a sort of a very much a European based organization, he has had a relationship with Eden for a very long time. And so he chaired that debate. And I mean, I, I think the, the the proposition was defeated, but it was actually very close. I think the, the result matters less than I think than the actual kind of conversation around why this is a, an important topic. Um, and so I think they really did encapsulate something that people are really worried about or not knowing how to engage with, <clears throat> which is that, you know, is it worth doing a, you know, making AI policies in institutions and the, you know, or are they toothless, useless, and a waste of time? So you spend a lot of time, but why are they? so that you know? I find that quite um, interesting and, and energizing, even though I had to then do my presentation after that. Um, and so um, I don't know what, what I think about that. I hope they're not toothless, useless, and a waste of time, having trying to develop one right now for UCP. Um, but uh, I think something like a debate or something that brings everybody together in a kind of interactive way is actually a very nice thing for a conference to do. And I wonder whether we shouldn't do that in some kind of online um, events as well, where we get away from the kind of presentation mode to, to something that is more like a more like a debate. Um, and they had put teams from different universities together to be either for or against the motion. Um, yeah, so that's really, so if I'm, maybe I can just take uh, uh, five, 10 minutes, I'm happy to have, share what I spoke about. And then um, if, if there's any questions, and then Anita, we can hand over to you and maybe you can <clears throat> share what you, what you find on the slide. Um, could I <clears throat> just say that I can't get into chat? Um, so um, I'll, I think I'll email Tony afterwards, if you can hear me now. Okay. Thanks, okay. Valerie. Okay. So I'm not going to do the full presentation. I'm kind of almost going to do a reflection on doing the presentation. So I have put in a paper um, called The Possibilities and Challenges of Process-Driven Assessment Design and Environment of Based AI, which I think met one of the themes. And... Um, uh, you know, as one does when one goes to a global conference, you kind of explain your context and your positionality. And I thought it was important going into Eden to say something about UCP. Um, you know, where the university is situated um, in terms of its, um, it, you know, where it is in South African sector, what our challenges are, and I specifically focus on the, you know, the history that has shaped teaching and learning, um, feeding school, roads and school, the COVID experience, um, and that I was particularly interested in assessment because of my role in um, working on UCP's assessment policy. At the same time, we now have to um, deal with generative AI. So I think that was a little bit of context. I also took the opportunity to share the work that we've been doing at UCP around um, uh, staff, supporting staff and students in the kind of first line of understanding 
understanding Joan Trebeo. I thought I'm going to share the guide. And um, I think that was, it was quite nice to, start, to have something visual to share. And then I kind of made the argument that, you know, assessment is getting more complicated. And I was comparing how, and, and this is not just because of generative AI, but that um, we have had, you know, a challenge is to what we might call very clear over the years, traditional ways of doing assessment was uh, evolving. Um, and there, and so we have, we are, I would argue, moving away from assessing students on the artifacts that they produce that we think demonstrate their attainment to learning outcomes. So an essay of dissertation, they are seen as proxies of learning, um, but evolving approaches over the years has meant to move to different types of assessments, such as what we call open book assignments or take home assignments. I managed to mention that the humanities faculty UT has done this over a number of years, but also that professional field, um, uh, and I'm using that uh, with care, you know, nieces in the room, where competency with particular tools like coding software is expected. So those types of um, assessments need to be more authentic, I suppose, uh, but still one produces particular types of artifacts that support websites and codes. And the point I was making is that our assessment practice have always or included uh, um, the use of devices, tools, scaffolding, um, uh, and so on. And now we have another type of very interesting uh, tools and technologies that have really just come into the space almost as an unsolicited social ex experiment. And I, my, my Conversation really was what you know what is happening to assessment, and then I, I unpacked the notion of cognitive offloading. That this is always something that we've done when we do any task and assessment. So that includes calculators, but it also includes other tools like um, coding software um, and so on. And that the ability to deploy these types of tools is the kind of learning outcome itself um, when 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 done properly according to the assessment design. Um, and, but I said that, you know, things have become more co complicated because students are using these kinds of now generative AI tools that are easy to use. They've got a very nice, um, user interface. And so students are able to cognitively offload, um, in ways that might not be, um, optimal for the assessment design. And therefore, is this leading to learning losses and what can we do about it? And, and really, what is it? that we are assessing and are our assessment valid? And I mean, I think by asking all those questions, I'm sort of saying, no, they're not. Um, I shared some you know, work that's being done elsewhere around how people are responding to assessment designs. You know, people are trying to avoid it, outrun it, or embrace and adapt. And those are kind of three types of areas. And I also shared um, uh, more you know, specific things um, around different ways people are responding from ignore to rethinking assessment. And you can see where the green boxes are. That's really where the literature is saying that we should be going in terms of assessment design. And that's just another rubric. And I was just sharing some of the things that um, I had come across in the literature. So I'll flip through. But really, I made the point now that I think, by and large, the non invigilated take home assignment output as a valid assessment proximity is dead, no longer valid, no longer uh, um, an, an, an assessment with integrity. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge, possibly embrace um, AI tools. And I did make that rather hideous graphic using that Um And so I thought one of the, the the responses could be that rather than assessing the artifacts, are there possibilities to assess the process by which the artifact was um, created? And there is quite a lot of literature suggesting that that is a feasible, desirable um, possibility. You know, can we establish audit trails of progress? Can we see what the students are doing when they make their um, way towards an excellent assessment design? And then I suggested that the technology, there may be technology enabled responses to the assessing processes. So are there tools that can do this? Um, and in fact, since this presentation, Grammarly and Turnitin have released new tools that actually claim to 
track process and that's something that we will be looking into a little bit more. Um, can we ask students themselves to give us evidence of the process? So this is reflections, blog posts, screenshots of um, using Gen AI on, for example, can, can we ask students to do this? Both I think for opportunity and limitations. And then lastly, I said, can we apply some of the principles of authentic assessment? Um, so things that are very real world so that less, so that if they are more authentic, actually include these tools as part of the desirable um, assessment design and so on. And, and all of these have limitations. And this is really very this was not a presentation that was particularly happy or going to solve anything, but it was really about talking through some of the issues. And then I said, effectively, if we want to catch the process, there's a shared responsibility, including technology students and authentic process. And then my last slide was really that this is also um, has its own ethical, logistical, pedagogical issues um, as well. And that was it. So that was the uh, a run through my presentation. Um, and uh, the reason I kind of did it at Eden was that I was really um, keen on getting some feedback, actually, on, on, on this type of thinking. And I think one of the issues for me, and it's something I have to think about if I do go back to Eden or another conference, is that you never have enough time to really unpack your thinking. So the questions are quite rushed. Um, for concise papers, I think you only have 10, 12 minutes, and it just really wasn't enough time to do that unpacking. So I have to really think about, like, if I want that kind of forum, where would I do that? But nonetheless, I, I just get some, you know, sort of useful useful feedback. Um, so for me, it was it was worth it, because anyway, going to a conference means you actually have to do something, like put together a presentation, write a paper, so there's nothing as effective as a deadline for me. So I think that was... was um, so overall, that was a positive experience, and I hope uh, that wasn't too boring. Thanks. Um, I'll stop there and hand over to you now, Anika, but also I can take any questions. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, should we first see if uh, anyone has questions? Um, or if there's anything else you would like details about? I can um, tell you if you get the holiday opportunity, Graz is quite a lovely place to explore. Valerie. Yes. Is that a question? Um, it, it's been interesting. I haven't understood all of what goes on in AI yet, I yet but I am using it in one particular way, which um, suits me. Um, when people want to know more about what I do and learn with Grandma, which is uh, on f in 52 countries now around the world, including South Africa, um, I tell them, I give them a little brief uh, introduction to what I do and then I say and you can always look on AI so I'm <laughs> using AI in my way that helps to, helps me it saves me writing a lot more stuff and that must have been when, um, when I AI'd myself I was gobsmacked that there was so much there um, I, I, and was it I, correct um, yes it was not only correct I'd also it was also some stuff that I'd forgotten I'd done <laughs> Lovely. But it's not totally up to date. It mm -hmm. um it seems to be about an a year behind. Um, I uh -huh. suppose that's because the information mm -hmm. has to be collected in order to be, keep it up to date. Um, but that was my impression that it was about a year out of date. Lovely. So, Good to know. Very Thanks interesting. Nice to see you, Tony. Yeah. And also my friend Francisca, I saw, has also joined. I think she's left now. But um, it was interesting. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, I couldn't put my email in the, in the chat, but Tony has got it. <coughs> All the I best, you. Valerie. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think um, one of the things I mean, I, I was mentioning, I came out of a workshop and we were talking about what are the AI literacies, AI literacies or capabilities that we want to build in and one of them is is to get your hands dirty with these tools is to you know um you know without wanting to um you know humanize them they they do you do get quite surprising results 
on some, on any given day, depending on what prompts you put in. And over time, I think it's it's engagement that helps um, get to a you know a sort of more informed understanding over time. I think one of the things that amused me most was when my grand one of my grandchildren email uh, AI'd me and said never do you did all of this granny <laughs> so that was quite funny um they just think i'm an old bird who sits in, in a cottage in in rural wales um and does her garden and walks her dog i do do those things too um and it's a beautiful day today <laughs> so i'm going to get back out in the garden lovely to have met you girls you. and if you do want to get in touch as i say tony has got my email but i'm the only valerie woodgate in the world so I am actually dead easy to find um yeah. on Google oh, we'll, just, we'll just ask AI, AI. And, and Facebook <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> bye thank you bye bye <laughs> yeah I haven't googled or AI'd myself yet um <laughs> uh, I'm a bit it's nervous uh, to find you. out to leave what you, the bye world bye. thinks of me <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Valerie. So, uh, Sukaina, do you think you're going to be making the next Eden conference? Um, yeah, it's on my my radar. Yes, um, I haven't seen the theme though yet. So, I guess right. when when that comes out, um, I'll have a look at it. So, um, uh. One of the takeaways that I will share briefly with you is um, I met um, who I discovered was uh, a bit of a, a, a godfather, should I say, of, of the Conference of Eden, Paul Bassage. Um, he's based in oh, the yeah. UK. Yeah. And um, so this is one of the advantages of going to a conference and having an in-person conference. I would never have um, been attracted to a talk of his, uh, he is more at a high level, institutional kind of organizing of tools. Um, but the advice that he gave me, I think is, is really pivotal. Um, and it's like obvious, I, I've probably heard this advice before, but it's sunk in now. He says, when you're researching, um, some advice he would give me since I asked for it was um, find something uncommon in your field to research. So because he, he would also come from a math background before his career diverged into um, bigger sort of management roles. Um, and he said, if you are researching the thing that lots of other people are researching, you're competing against everyone else who's going to have fairly sort of similar interests. And um, you know, you, you've got to have a stronger and a different, a more creative argument compared to if you're researching something that is um, less common in an area. Yeah. And I thought that is actually quite interesting as well. So um, I, I would say that was one of my big takeaways. He also said um, you should definitely be using postgraduate students to work on projects that interest you. So that's a, a space that I'm beginning to move into. I was also questioning how we do that uh, safely? How do I know that my mother is not the person sitting on Jenny AI saying, accept the next line, accept the next line and producing a master's thesis? Because when she asked me, what's the difference between her doing that and a student getting a master's degree from UCT? I was like, no, no, but the master's students who are paying fees and getting <laughs> their degrees uh, we're meeting with so that's there's a level of human interaction that is vetting that even if this person has generated some text which I'll, I'll never truly be able to know that they can defend their arguments that they can formulate an argument they can assess what is a better argument so to me that um, the use of uh, yeah of tools in the research space is something I'm, I'm keen to explore more. Hopefully the next conference would be doing that. I thought I think I'm getting to the next conference, but yeah, next time I've got a splurge of conferences in, <laughs> in Europe, I, I will try and go. Um, yeah. All right, any other questions? Let's check the chat. Uh, 
Um, so in the talk, I was just in um, some silk colleagues were talking about uh, UCT's policy on the use of AI tools in assessments. And the baseline is you may not use it at all unless it is defined that you may. So if a lecturer does not mention how you can use an AI tool, the default is you are doing the wrong thing if you use it except for check-in grammar and um, that kind of thing. And again, so, so a very basic use of AI tools is the current default in our assessments. And this causes students, I think, quite a bit of tension. I have daughters who have started studying. They, every time I say, but just run that through ChatGPT, just like, you know, ask ChatGPT what mm -hmm. it thinks. They're very reluctant. Um, they, they've they done it in the way that computer science programming lecturers I heard describing to check after you've written a program, get it to check, look for bugs and mm. ask how, how to improve it. And, and they do that as a reluctant last step after the six hours of frustration. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, that is not the way these tools should be used. I'm sure there is a, a, a more efficient way. Yeah. And Anita, what you just identified there is why we need policy. And um, because we need policy in order to mobilize effort for professional development and to mobilize resources to support effective and ethical use of these tools. And we need policy that is not useless, toothless, and inherently a waste of time. Outdated. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, Anita, it's interesting um, that you know that's considered the default. That if you're you're told not that you can use otherwise, because students interpret that in different ways. So another what we have said in the in the sort of guidelines as well is the recommendation is that. If you in your assessment, you must acknowledge them. Even if you say they shouldn't be used, you have to say it um, as well. So the absence should not be an excuse, I think, in now. But obviously, not all teaching staff have got that message or agree with it. So it's because at this stage, it is recommendations and good practice guidelines. But I think it does help because when it gets to disciplinary, um, and it's come on my, you know, like people ask, I'm saying, did you tell the students they couldn't use it? Then you have left, you're on shakier ground, really, if this goes further into some, any kind of disciplinary or legal something. Even though our academic misconduct policy does state that you may not use them for any, but because we're in such a gray liminal space, what these tools mm -hmm. actually do, um, and that some of the tools, like students don't really choose because they're now being embedded into Google Docs and Microsoft Word. And, you know, yeah, you, yeah. so it's almost like it's becoming part of the tool set that is almost um, there now. The autocomplete, then mm -hmm. autocomplete turns into should I summarize this paragraph for you, you know, and so yeah. on. And, you know, some universities, yeah. I think like Rhodes, actually license Grammarly for their students. Mm. So, you know, that what is Grammarly? It's an AI enabled tool. Absolutely. And honestly, so I think I, think I am so over is really important. Yeah. yeah. I'm over my my own bad writing and having to mm. read other bad writing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. not necessary anymore for us to um, you know. Mm try and unpack the meaning behind the the grammar mm. and you know even as as someone who's grown up reading in english and writing in english my whole life i've got a great advantage over other people for whom english is a maybe a third or fourth language um mm. but i still struggle and so you know there are barriers that other people are having to encounter um to a much greater extent that 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 need not to be the barrier if the purpose is the sharing of knowledge of, you know. So, so sometimes I think um, we don't know what might be lost if you take away the ability to write from scratch an essay. 
you know, to formulate those ideas. But what could be gained by using an AI tool to um, accelerate some of the steps and then to be able to assess mm -hmm. this makes a better essay than this one. This argument is weak in these and these points. So, you know, there's always a give and a take. Um, and it's, it's that uncertainty, I think, that makes people nervous. And then if, if you're, you're going to be judged and you're going to get a qualification that could be whipped away from you if you do something that is not allowed. I mean, ethics is, is really a, a place where a lot of people, um, they're, they're very nervous, many mm. students, about doing the wrong thing because they don't understand what the boundary is. And quite honestly, even for myself, mm. many times it's not clear what, you know, there's the core principle Mm. And you think that is what the ethic is, but actually the processes and the policies are so mm. unclear. Like if you have to lie when you fill in in your ethics form, <laughs> because mm. the project says, is this linked to another one? And if you say yes, mm. you can't mm. proceed. So you have to say mm. no, but it's not really true. You know, mm. so if I have to lie on an ethics form, it makes mm. me feel very um, uneasy. And, and I think that's the, the space the students are in. As you said, Tony, don't ask and don't tell, uh, but we, we feel uneasy. And so because it creates uh, such negative vibe emotions, um, it, it, people mm. don't seem to want to talk about it. Yeah, we're getting into the messy stuff here about <laughs> that relationship between ethics and gatekeeping and where they are different and where they overlap in ways that are difficult to distinguish from each other yeah mm -hmm. and obviously um you know this becomes a very difficult terrain both for individual educators and for students and for people involved in making policy choices um, i know that mm -hmm. gradually people are drifting away because other things need to be happening in their lives and I really want to thank the two of you, Sukaina and Anita, for bringing your reflections and insights from the Eden Conference um, and providing um, food for thought, as well as a good tourist pitch for Graz and a very powerful pitch for getting to the Eden Conference at least once in our careers, if not more often. So thank you very much to both of you um, on behalf of Emerge Africa. If people want to stick around for more conversation, you're welcome to do that. Um, but don't feel that you have to stay away from anything else that is urgent that you need to be doing in this afternoon. And I know the number of people here have been very quiet. So if you've got any questions or comments at this point, please feel free to come in. Now is your chance. Can I come in, please? Please do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to pass my special thanks, especially to you, Tony, because uh, uh, from the beginning, I had a phobia with regard to technology. But since I completed my online facilitation last year from the University of Cape Town, uh, I've seen a lot of improvement. I really want to let you know that I'm grateful and thankful for the assistance and the skills you give to us. Thank you very much. This is Tsiliso Khayan from Lesotho, National University of Lesotho. Thank you. Tsiliso, thank you so much for that. Um, and I must acknowledge the amazing facilitating online team who basically did like 95% of the work of facilitation in that course. Um, the ex yeah, and um, thank you for the support for, this, for the facilitating online course. There are many routes to become more competent with technology, and, but what works best is where it's integrated with learning about your context and your pedagogy at the same time. So thank you very much for that, Siliso. Any comments from anybody else about the conference, the AI, um, any, um, let's just say, 
interesting and challenging questions for Sukena and Anita at this point as a kind of parting shot. No? Tony, Sorry, I'm looking, I'm looking for my hand ray. Oh, I don't know where it is. I'm not enough on Zoom. Um, <laughs> UJ is a, is a Microsoft space. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether... Um, so one of the things I've been thinking through in AI a lot, I think our initial reactions, you know, November, December, January, of, what was it, 2022, 2023, was very much... Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, assessment integrity. Oh, what's going to, you know, kind of it was a obsession with kind of assessment or maybe started off academic integrity and kind mm -hmm. of moved over to assessment, integ assessment integrity. And I think in my own thoughts, I'm kind of stuck now with learning integrity because I think the thing that frustrates me the most is when I ask, and this is not even with, with university students, it's with university staff. When I ask in a course, tell me what is your expectation of this course? It's very personal. Mm. You know, why are you in this course, voluntary? And I get a chat GPT response. Now that tells me mm. the authenticness of being here and being present and engaging is being handed over. And so for, my, for me, our conundrum sits with this kind of learning integrity, the desire to want to learn. The desire to want to understand and, and part of that I think conundrum is probably also around I think you alluded to it Anita is is I'm not so I know I learn and learned a hell of a lot through through writing and I think through writing but I'm not sure if that is necessarily the only way to learn <laughs> so part for me of our challenges is how do we try out ways in which we learn that is not the way we thought we must learn so, so i think probably those two areas of kind of learning integrity and authenticness and kind of how do we how do we learn now in different ways thanks oh that's a great great question karina um i mean i agree with you that it's it actually it's assessment integrity and learning integrity what are you know? What are the learning losses or what are the learning gains? I don't think we know yet fully in terms of generative AI because, as you say, we 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 have some assumptions that that thinking happens through writing, thinking, um, you know, and so the ability to write an essay from scratch to plan a first draft of the core essential skill. I hear that quite a bit, but I also have students. Um, in our focus group saying um, I just can't deal with a blank page and you know if I get something like a spark then I'm on my way and I'm thinking well isn't that so different from talking to a colleague or a parent and getting a spark right or something so I don't I mean I don't have a I think these are like really interesting questions but they're almost broad that they are kind of technology acceptance but also like what is the need that is being fulfilled in the human um, around wanting to interact with these kinds of tools um, and it seems like a it seems like a very inhuman relationship because these are machines and, and um, you know stochastic parrots if we want to use that and, and, you know, so how can you possibly learn? But I don't know. There's something there around the dialogic process that seems to be helping some students um, get, take agency. I think maybe that's the word I'm using here. It's like who has the agency um, and who gets to say how they learn. And I think for me, we are in this interesting contested space around that. But I... Do you, I, I mean, I get where you're coming from, Karina. The, the, the kind of almost like a sense of loss, maybe, um, that uh, about what we think, you know, people need to go through a particular type of learning process. I'll, I'll stop there, maybe Anita has a, has a view. Yeah. So one thing that also strikes me is um, 
you can't tell necessarily unless you engage further with a, a person whether the chat gpt product was based on input that they gave that chat gpt dressed up or a blank screen saying oh i have this task do it for me so um, that's one of the, the, the problems that I, I foresee, especially with postgraduate students uh, and, and even having to review journal papers. If I don't know the person, I don't know how much effort and thought they have already put in. I don't know whether I'm getting 90% chat GPT or 5% chat GPT. So um, that judgment call uh makes it hard and, and a lot of people will take the hard line that you know I'm, I'm going to assume that the the tool did most of the work mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a gray area and yeah you're so right so I, I think maybe personality types also will come into the people who are perhaps more flexible and um, curious about what we can explore and and try um, and, and then, you know, what we will be losing, we won't know. So, yeah, we're going into an experimental space. Mm. Um, and, and I guess going slowly then is the human way of trying to mitigate and, you know, do a bit of experimenting and make them still do some old fashioned things and, and, and then try and do damage control that way. I don't know. But to me, it feels like um, there are quite a lot of opportunities for learning in, in leaps that might be missed. Um, and also, uh, I'm hopeful about places and people who now have access to learning and who never did. So um, exploring the, the people who have been shut out, say, of higher education spaces, or like maybe staff members who, who haven't been able to develop themselves in a certain way because of limitations in their life and their backgrounds that never gave them opportunities that maybe now have a chance to move forward with something. Um, I'm, I'm interested and I haven't seen much conversation of those kind of spaces. You know, it's, it's a lot about trying to maintain the standards uh, and, and move forward, but carefully. And, and there's brand new spaces and opportunities, people who perhaps, you know, have impairments that stop them um, accessing what most universities can offer for people who want to transition out of a career. Um, you know, uh, there's maybe sometimes we need a brand new way of learning it's not, and, and not a one size fits all. Yeah. but. Lots of deep questions in this space. Um, Thank you, Anita. No Thank easy you, answers. Taylor. Look, I think what's happening here is that if we were to take both of your answers and do a textual analysis, we could probably come up with an agenda for a whole conference, if not a collaborative book. Um, <laughs> and I, I like to you could ask to... Chat GPT to do it. Um, yeah. well, to, to point. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I just had another thought, which is really thinking about the case that you discussed, Karina. I think there's something there about students negotiating with power and that there are power relationships in education. And when your lecturer asks you to do something and you can't see why you're doing it, um, and maybe even you don't have an answer, and you think, oh, I've got to provide an answer to get this person from um, hassling me. You'll find a way to get an answer, even if it's not necessarily your answer. And I suspect that there are also some students who really feel the sense of um, pressure and possibly even humiliation to be there in front of the class or even provide a written answer which is inarticulate and very poorly formed because they haven't got more at the moment. Um, so it's there's so much complexity in the way um, educators and students relate to this use of generative AI. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should just ask um, ask you, Sukena and 
Anita, if you ha want to just share one or two brief closing thoughts, and then we can adjourn for the afternoon. Um, well, I think um, maybe just to say that this, I'm actually really grateful for this moment, actually, in in the development, you know, whether it's recorded like, you know, the evolution of digital education or educational technology or just the, because I think that there's real opportunity for shifts um, because it might seem like forced shift, but the conversations that I'm having with people because, you know, assessment drives learning, <laughs> whether we like it or not, to some extent, you know, and, and, and I'm just like, I'm reminded of David Bow's quote that students can escape the effects of poor teaching, but they cannot escape the effects of poor assessment. And that is, I just think that, and I'm sort of banging on about assessment because I think that it's been one of the areas that has really held firm in many ways to the detriment of our students, I think. And so for me, I'm just like, I mean, it's, it's very difficult, but I think that I'm actually very grateful for this moment um, and, and to be able to be part of it and, and to have conversations and, and to shape it. Thanks. I guess my parting shot is um, I am trying to learn from what AI does when it pauses before it gives a better answer. So um, that's reminding me, pause and think. Um, and yeah, you've probably come up with a better answer then. Yeah, no, no easy ones. But thank you so much for the opportunity to engage with you all. Thank you, Sukaina. I'm glad to yeah, see the presentation now. Anita and Tony. And, and for Tony and Jacob for um, hosting us. Thank you. Thank you, Sakena. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, everybody who is here, including the ones who have left the room. Um, and I think this has been a very generative conversation. And maybe uh, we need to pause and um, come back to it a little bit later. <laughs>